Hi guys. A couple of minutes to join. So as you're joining, we would love it if you could throw in the chat where you're joining us from and what you're sipping on. I'm gonna throw up a poll as well because we'd love to get to know you guys a little better and where you currently stand on bourbon and all that good stuff. And if you've had either of these brands before, so go ahead and take Let the poll. Know. Let us know where you're joining from in the chat. Where is my <clears throat> chat? I can't see it. There it is. Looks like Scott's sipping on something brown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Ed. Nice to see you back again. Russ is back again too. Thanks for joining us again. Those of you who've been here in the past, we love when we have some repeat guests. Nice to see familiar faces. Yeah, we're definitely hoping with these, we start to create a little virtual tasting community that yeah. we can all hang out and get to know each other and do this more often. And to those of you that we don't know, welcome, welcome as well. Mm -hmm, Thanks mm -hmm. for coming. We're gonna get started in just a minute. <clears throat> Oh, I see Melissa's here, and Melissa is actually from Kentucky. She lives here in California now, but she's from Kentucky, so she's very familiar with bourbon, so we're excited to have her here. Ed, I'm always so jealous whenever I see you, you and your aloha from Hawaii. That's where we all want to be stuck, sheltering in place, man. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> very jealous. <laughs> oh, Napa Valley is not bad, Cheryl. Yeah. That, that's not a bad place to be either. <laughs> I feel like we have a good quorum of people to get started. What do you think? We could give maybe a couple more minutes. It's another uh, minute or so. Only six, only six oh three. three. I'm excited. I want to start drinking. Oh well, <laughs> they're poured. I know. They're here. I know. They're ready for you. I was just I was just telling our our makers before we got on that I'm very excited tonight is here because we've been having a really hard time not not drinking down these bottles too far before the event. So <laughs> um, these are some these are some treats. These bourbons. Yeah, if you haven't poured yourself a little of either of these yet. Um, you're, in you're, you're in for a treat. Yeah. You're in for a treat. For sure. Hollywood, Maryland. I didn't know there was a Hollywood in Maryland. Cool. Oh, the garlic capital of the world. Let's see. Wait, that's here. That's Gilroy. Yeah, that's Gilroy. I'm like, wait, there's a festival. You smell it as you drive by. It's yeah. hard to, it's hard <laughs> to miss. We have the, the Gilroy Garlic Festival every year, and that's the first time I ever had garlic ice cream oh, was there. Man. Yeah. I mean, there's such a thing as taking a good thing too far. It wasn't bad, to be honest. Really? It wasn't bad. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That sounds... Do they have garlic soda? Probably. Yeah. That, see, that also seems like a little <laughs> bit of a stretch for me. I bet you could make a fun cocktail with some garlic liqueur. I'm yeah. going to challenge you on that. That's a... That's a... <laughs> It's, it's high, quite praise, a challenge. high praise of your mixology well, skills. thank you. <laughs> all right, it's 6.05. We're going to get started. Let's go. Yeah, let's do it. Um, all right. Hi, guys. Welcome, everyone. I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cask, whose mission is all about supporting craft alcohol makers and celebrating their stories, sharing their stories, making sure great craft alcohol enthusiasts like all of you get to know who they are so you can keep stocking your bar with amazing, fun, new craft products. And I'm Evan. I'm a certified sommelier and cider professional and a bespoke wine tour guide. Uh, and so we've kind of joined up to combine our passions uh, and continue to expose people um, and makers to their audiences. Uh, and uh, these virtual tasting experiences have been a really fun way to do that. And yeah, uh, been delighted to have such warm responses from attendees and from the makers that have been so gracious to join us and talk about their lovely products. Yeah. And so speaking of our makers, hey, Kristen and uh, Alex, if you could just give us a wave so everyone knows who you are there um, and say hello. So there's Kristen and Alex up there. So Kristen is from, um, he's with our low gap kind of California whiskey here from the American Craft Whiskey Distillery. There you go. And then Alex is from 1-8 Distilling, and they make this delicious District Made bourbon right here out in D.C. Yes. Um, and so we were joking Sonia's before. Nice. So we were joking before that we, we love that we're doing a bourbon event, and we don't have any makers from Kentucky. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, and let's see. All right. So, so. 
this is going to be 90 minutes. Um, that's what we typically go for. We used to do them at 60 and we just found we had way too much fun in 60 minutes. And so we extended them to 90. And honestly, sometimes we have a little after party afterwards and they go even longer. Yep. So if you're, if you're really enthusiastic and you want to keep talking bourbon, we're on West Coast time. So we can hang out for a little while usually. Um, but we're going to chat. Um, Evan and I are going to chat just for a few minutes, maybe five, seven minutes to kind of get us all settled and oriented. And then we're going to hand it over to our featured makers and get to start talking. But before I jump into some of our stuff, let's do a quick cheers, everyone. And just welcome to be, thank you for being here and welcome. If you could hold your drink up to your camera, that makes it, yeah, I love seeing what everyone's drinking. That's so fun. Love it. Great. Cheers, virtually. Cheers. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Um, all right. So first things first, if this is your first time joining us here at the Crafty Cask, um, we used to host these kind of popular, oh, I didn't drink. I always do that. Evan always yells at me. I'm going gonna, gonna to cheers all of you again and then. It's poor form to cheers and then put the glass down. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm too much of a talker. I, I get carried away and I, I just want to talk. Um, so if this is your first time joining us at the Crafty Cast, we used to do in-person kind of meet the maker events where we would essentially do the same thing, bring two to three makers together around a theme, get some enthusiastic consumers together and get to learn all about a style of alcohol. And then you get to kind of rub elbows with the makers and get to know them and ask them your questions. And people really loved them. And then when, you know, our whole world turned upside down, we decided to roll with it and make them virtual. Um, and so what we love about these events is that it gives us an opportunity to support these incredible craft makers by sharing their story and helping them sell some of their products. Because while, you know, we all know a lot of industries are really struggling right now and craft alcohol is certainly one of them. It's really hard when you really rely on those in-person relationships and people coming into your distillery and drinking your products at bars and restaurants and that kind of just disappears overnight. And so we're really excited that this is an opportunity to support them and for all of you to support them by buying their delicious booze as well. Um, and it allows you, no matter where you are in the world, to, to kind of learn about craft alcohol, meet the makers themselves, which, you know, I always kind of tease Evan that, you know, he gives wine tours and his wine tours are amazing. So when we can do that again, if you want to go on a wine tour, look Small, him up. Small, like bespoke kind of uh, wine tours uh, with a focus on, you know, boutique Makers. wineries yeah. that um, don't have a lot of presence on the grocery store shelves. And nevertheless, nevertheless, very often a lot of his guests, they always want to meet the maker, right? You always want to meet the winemaker and get to talk to them. And it's rare when you go on tours, wine tours, distillery tours, because they're often busy making the alcohol. So one of the benefits that I think these virtual events actually have over the in-person events is that you're guaranteed to get maker time um, and to get to talk to them and get to know them and ask your questions and and you know develop that relationship. Yeah, so thanks again, Alex and Crispin, for joining us tonight. It's a very kind of you. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you who bought your bottles in advance to have a little bit of a more immersive experience tonight, that's awesome. If you didn't buy your bottles, yes, I see some up there, yay. Um, if you didn't buy your bottles in advance, we are going to do our best to make you super jealous tonight. So you want to buy some afterwards because like I said, these are delicious. Um, and we'll make sure to be putting links in the chat so you know where exactly where you can buy that. And then of course, if you're having an amazing time tonight and you wanna support us so that we can keep doing lots more of these events for all of you for free, we'll also put some links in there so you can tip your hosts on Venmo or PayPal as well. Um, and speaking of, if you do want to have a more immersive experience at any of our upcoming future events, we have some really fun stuff coming up. Next week, we have a Rhone Varietals wine tasting um, with Sin Banderas and Zanoli wines. And then we have, gosh, a vodka tasting. So if you think all vodka tastes like nothing and, you know, it's not for sipping, let me tell you, the craft revolution is changing that. There are some really delicious sipping vodkas. And that is coming from a girl who for a very long time said, I am not a vodka girl. Um, and so there's some really incredible stuff out there. So that vodka tasting will be fun. We have a pre-Father's Day vodka and whiskey tasting with Charvet Distillery, a Pacific Northwest cider tasting, a California cab tasting. We have so many fun events coming up. So whatever you like to drink, we probably have you covered. Um, and so you can check them all out. If maybe you can throw the link to join the events in our um, sure. chat. You can check out the whole calendar and what to buy and where to buy it and pre-order your stuff so that you can be sipping on it while we're talking, which is the best experience, but it's totally fine to join if you don't have the, the bottles too. We'll allow it. Yes. <laughs> that. Let's talk bourbon. Let's talk bourbon. Yeah. 
So, um, um, so I'm curious if, you know, uh, we were t talking earlier that it feels like a lot of, you know, for a while anyways, people really thought like to be a bourbon, you had to come from a Kentucky, yeah. right? So do you want to talk a little bit about maybe where that came from and why that is? Yeah, sure. So, and Crispin and Alex, feel free to jump in and correct yeah. us and add on to this conversation here, of course. It's kind of a historical thing. Um, whiskey uh, made in Bourbon County uh, in Kentucky um, was stamped with that on the label. And um, as these whiskeys were distributed out, people would be, you know, begin asking for bourbon whiskey, bourbon county whiskey. Um, and then it just became bourbon. And uh, the region in Kentucky where these whiskeys were being made had a few features that made it um, unique. Yeah, unique and, and kind of lended to the style that bourbon is known for, uh, which is you know, a little on the sweeter side um, and a couple of factors uh, of, the, of the climate uh, and the region there contribute to that. One is the, the blue limestone that uh, filters the water that falls from the sky there and is you know, collected in aquifer. And this blue limestone filters out a lot of the iron content and replaces it with magnesium and calcium, which when used uh, to you know, make the whiskey lends to the kind of sweet characteristic that bourbon is kind of known for. And then in addition to that, um, the corn. It was, yeah, it was back in like, I think there was like a, an act in 1776 called something like the Corn Patch and Cabin Rights Act or something. And it was way back in 1776. And this was fascinating when I, I read about this where basically the government was kind of enticing people because corn grows really well there based on the fertile ground and everything. And so they basically said, hey, new settlers, if you're willing to come and build a cabin and plant corn, we'll give you 400 acres. Can you imagine 400, 400 acres, acres <laughs> if you would like plant a crop and build a house, yeah. you know? And so- The old pioneer days where you like, you know, stake your claim yeah. and the government says, oh, you want that land? It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so it became really popular to live in this region and grow corn and, you know, people were making whiskey and especially this was also around the time when, because prior to whiskey being really popular in the United States, rum was kind of the spirit of prevalence. Um, and so that was really prevalent for a long time. But this was also around the time where kind of the triangle trade was starting to fall apart. The, you know, British were starting to tax heavily on the U.S. because they didn't want competition for some of this yeah. stuff on sugar and things of that nature. And so rum started to fall out of favor around that time as well. And then you had all these settlers coming in from Ireland and all these countries that, you know, grain distilling was very popular, Scotland, sure. right? And so now they're here and they're getting 400 acres if they plant corn and all right. I'm going to make some, I'm going to make go. some whiskey with that yeah. corn. Yeah. In 1776, some of you might recall the British and the English had a little spat <laughs> and, uh, the English didn't come out on top in that spat, and so they controlled a lot of the trade in the Caribbean, which is where sugar was coming from to make rum. And so all these, you know, rum producers in Maryland and in Massachusetts, uh, you know, their raw material disappeared, and so that uh, went by the wayside. And they started making another product. Um, and now we're lucky enough to have bourbon, but you yeah. know, it, so it kind of it gained its popularity in Kentucky. It kind of came from that region because it was made in Bourbon County. Um, that you know people across the country when they would see that stamp that it was from bourbon county and taste it and realize it tasted a little different kind of started calling it bourbon at least this is one theory there are a few theories about sure. how bourbon bourbon got street its name. in louisiana is it's another theory right that people really love to drink this on bourbon street um so yeah so there's a few different theories but at the end of the day you do not have to be made in kentucky to be bur bourbon that was never the case you do have to be made in the united states right. though you cannot be called bourbon if you're made outside of the united states um, and yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Christian and Alex can, uh, share Any some other, other fun general bourbon kind origin, of origin stories of bourbon, uh, at things. least the name. I thought that was a, a fun thing. I'd, I'd be willing to chime in there. Yeah. Um, the current regulations and a lot of the laws that we have around production of spirits today are, um, are things that were enacted and settled right after prohibition ended in 1932. And so the current, uh, you know, the federal government has standards of identity or legal definitions for certain spirits, including bourbon. And so um, the current um, definition of bourbon is set 
forth in the Congressional Federal Register. And it does require that if you're going to use the word straight bourbon whiskey, it must be made in the United States and uh, uh, must be made of uh, three of four principal grains, corn, barley, wheat, and rye, and, and the current fashion. And some people think it's the regulation that it must be at least 51% corn and then it must have two other grains and a lot of people are doing uh, wheat and bourbon or wheat and barley or rye and barley and uh, must come out of the still at um, you know less than um, I think it's less than uh, 180. 160. Yeah, less less than 160. yeah that's right thank you out sure and um, and uh, it's got to go into the barrels at between uh, 60 and 62 and a half percent alcohol mm -hmm. We got to add a little water right mm -hmm. away, and then it has to go into new uh, American oak barrels of 53 gallons in size that are charred on the inside for a minimum of 24 months, and then we get to use the word straight bourbon whiskey. Gotcha. Essentially, yeah. Right. Well, there's a couple of things there that that they actually have changed. Uh, you you can now use oak from other areas. Uh, that's a relatively new thing. Um, I don't know why you would but you, you can use new charred French oak or new charred Hungarian oak uh, uh, and still make bourbon. It doesn't have to be a 53 gallon barrel. Uh, you can use a variety of sizes. Uh, of course, um, there's a lot of craft distillers out there that, that do use quite a few uh, small barrels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it does have to go into the barrel at less than 125 proof. And I think I, I read, I think I read that, so 51 is the minimum. I think 80% corn is the maximum. Um, and then that like average, like most people are kind of around the 70% corn area. But when you start to see like high rye bourbons or things like that, that usually just that, well, what, what that does mean is that there's a higher percentage of rye in there than kind of standard. So that usually means it's down lower for the corn percentage, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong guys. Um, but so it would be a lower percentage of corn still above that 51% mandatory to make more room for more of that rye for like a high rye bourbon. Um, and so those are kind of fun too when you start to play around with those, especially if you like rye whiskey and you like that spicy note because then you have a little bit of the sweetness from the bourbon, a little bit of spice from the rye. And so there's all different, even within just bourbon, there's all different varieties. And so one of the myths I always really want to bust when it comes to bourbon is that all bourbons are like sweet, cloyingly, you know, like cloyingly yeah. sweet. There are certainly some out there that are sweet, um, but there are lots out there that are really kind of balanced and not super sweet. And it, the, the high rye ones have that spice in them too. Yeah. So if, you know, for people who have tried a few bourbons and they're like, eh, bourbon's not really for me. I always encourage you like, keep trying, keep, I, my, my favorite term with all of these, with, with alcohol is keep kissing more frogs, you know, because <laughs> you know, don't give up, don't give up on the drinking of the booze. Like you'll, you'll find one you like, I promise. <laughs> so the current bottling of low gap bourbon whiskey that you have is, um, you know, the mash bill is 55% corn and 30% malted rye and 15% malted barley. Are you talking about your low gap right here? Yeah. Can you can you repeat those percentages again? Yes, fifty-five percent corn, thirty percent malted rye, and fifteen percent um, malted barley. Okay, great, cool. Yeah, and actually, Crispin, we were going to start with your um, yours tonight anyway. So if you want to kind of jump in and tell us a little bit about. The origins of low gap, yeah. how you got your start distilling and what inspired you to make this product. Yeah, yeah. we can kind of jump okay. into your story. Um, um, I, I started working in a winery in 1983 in Pleasanton, California. I moved to Mendocino County in 1985 to get more involved in winemaking and um, I used to work at a winery called Hidden Cellars, which was vinifying wine for Germain Robin brandy that was mm -hmm. being made by Alambic Incorporated at the time. And I uh, started Kristen, Hidden for Cellars those in, who don't... Uh, in the summer of 1989. I got a phone call. Oh, what? Uh -oh. oh, 
Um, I was just going to ask for those who don't know, I, I like Jermaine Roban is a very big name in the distilling world, but for those who don't know, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, was he one of the first to bring over the copper alambic still and kind of use it here in the U.S.? Yeah, it's like uh, um, Miles Terikasevich who started uh, Charbet yeah. and, um, and, and Hubert Jermaine Roban, they both kind of started at about the same time. And, um, and yes, it was a really remarkable thing. Ansley Cole and Hubert Germain Robin got together. Hubert grew up in Cognac. He's from an old Cognac family. His <laughs> grandfather and grandfathers before, before them were Jules Robin. Jules Robin was one of the big five Cognac makers before World War II. Uh, the big five had the world market divided. And so Jules Robin uh, was selling to Asia. And as we know, I mean, World War II more or less started in China with the Japanese invading China. And then the revolution in China meant that nothing was being imported in China anymore. And so Jules Robin kind of ended and part of, part of it sold to Martel and a major portion of their inventory went to Hennessy. And so Hubert, uh, who, who I had the great good fortune to work with, um, uh, spent his formative years working at places like Hennessy, Cognac. And um, so when the day came that I got a phone call, would I come interview to be the Brandy Master's assistant at Germano Van Brandy? Well, of course I did. I, at first, I didn't believe the call was real. I thought, wait a minute, is this someone I'm going to went to school was playing a joke on me. But no, it was real. And um, and that's why, that's just why for everyone else, I wanted him to give a little context. I had to been managing uh, yeah. wine, sit on the winery and preparation of reds for bottling. And um, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, they were, they were one of the first and the project had been going for about six years when I climbed on board, and um, I really, really wanted to learn what he was doing. My my um, father's family had a dairy in Minnesota, which was a front for an illicit distillery that ran for more than 32 years, from the 1920s into the 1950s. And uh, I really wanted to be involved in distillation. I mean, my my uh, background is um, uh, I'm you know my father is an Irish citizen, and my mother is. Um, uh, her father was Scottish and her mother's Irish, so I've uh, practically got it in the blood. <laughs> and and um, so years later, um, of course, I wanted to do my own projects. The very first day I worked with Hubert, he said, one of these days we'll have to make bourbon. And I said, wait a minute, you're making the best brandy in the world. What do you mean bourbon? He goes, well, this is what Americans want. <laughs> and he said, brandy's a tough market. I can make good brandy, and we will. And we are, but eventually we should do something else. And that was the first conversation. And um, you know, and what did I really know about making whiskey at the time? Well, a uh, winemaker I'd worked with at Hidden Cellars is a guy named Jeff Hinchliff, who now is at uh, Hannah in Sonoma County. I think he's CFO or something now there. And he was, he's much older. And uh, he actually went to UC Davis to study how to make beer, but he was his education and life were ahead of the curve on the uh, craft beer thing. So he had to go into wine. So Jeff told me so much about fermenting uh, grains and uh, how to ferment grains and malts to make whiskey. And um, then I get the job at uh, Germain Robin and um, you know, everything I make, and I make a, a number of different things from rose liqueur and absinthe to a variety of whiskeys with a, a spectrum of flavor profiles, including the one in your hand, just about everything started as a small project at home. Where I had to experiment, perfect things, to make things, to figure out what I'm going to do and how I'm going to go forward. So eventually, um, I started talking with Ansley Cole, craft distillers in Alambic, and, and said, you know, I really want to do my own projects. And the first thing um, my, uh, my wife and I, Tamar, wanted to make was our rose liqueur. And um, we did a good job doing that. And that's kind of unique and wonderful. And 
Then we started doing absinthe and then whiskey and gin and vodka and so on. So the whiskey, um, one of the things about um, uh, a man who was James Hennessy is he was actually an Irishman and he had a distillery in Cork in the 18th century and the English were making life difficult for him. So he decided to become French and moved to Cognac and moved to pot stills to Cognac and uh, championed the pot still and Cognac at a time when you know, Armagnac and Calvados were changing to uh, a, a form of a column still where it would be one pass through the still. James Hennessy championed the pot still and the double distillation process we know today out of Cognac. And so what I've done is, is kind of a return to that whole, that whole spirit and I'm using old cognac stills to make whiskey using the old double distillation method from cognac. And I think I'm having some success with it. I'm making whiskey from corn and barley. I'm making the bourbon, a malted wheat whiskey and malted rye. And all side by side, you see a variety of flavors from very light in the corn barley blend to not quite so light with the bourbon to start to become heavier with the malted rye and then you know, and the malted wheat. And I just think it's a wonderful thing. And now I've got enough elements in the cellar that I'm starting to do complex blending of uh, malted rye and malted wheat and malted rye and, and bourbon. And um, I started with three and five component blends and now I have in the barrel 10 component blends that are just, it's the next thing that's gonna happen. So the bourbon, I, um, I just, you know, I started making uh, wheat whiskey and then corn. And by the time I got to bourbon, I had um, really gotten my chops down on making whiskey. And, um, um, and so, it, yeah, I took some, some time to get there. I didn't want to just jump into bourbon while, while I personally was still a little green making making whiskey <laughs> there's the fossiling crew there's there's stuff well um i really enjoy doing it and i really feel privileged to um uh be able to have uh, grown out of um germano bam brandy and i feel so privileged to uh, be an alternating proprietor in their facility and um it's just been uh a wonderful 30 years, you know, since I started. I, I was 26 when I started distilling in 89, and now I'm 57. So uh, it's been uh, been magical, magical life for sure. Well, I think the bourbon is was well worth the wait because it is, yeah, it's really nice, Crispin. It, um, mm -hmm. and, and I mean this in the best way possible. I don't know how to say it without it maybe sounding a little weird, but when I first took a sip of it, I was like, you know, it's almost like a bourbon light but with still like the complexity and the and the reason I say that is like I can sip this straight like much more and much longer than most bourbons like it just has a light freshness to it um mm -hmm. that makes it very sippable and very just like smooth and easy drinking but still has all the complexity of the different elements that you were just discussing yeah. and it's really yeah this is definitely probably going to be one of my new new favorite sipping bourbons in our in our bar along with the other one that we're featuring tonight because we got quite lucky with these two yeah yeah very much so well thank uh, you um i appreciate your comments um i can't tell you how many women have said to me at tasting events and trade shows how much they appreciate the fact that i've made a whiskey that they can share with their other women friends and I had no idea we were going to go that way. I have um, pretty much followed things to the letter where um, I'm fermenting to complete dryness with enzymes and a champagne yeast. It's taking me eight weeks, six to eight weeks to ferment, just like it were wine. I'm starting with a pretty heavy specific gravity. So I'm ending up with 10 or 11% alcohol before I go on the still. And then it's strictly um, adding water like the law would have us do. 
and uh, going into number two and number three char barrels. And that's it. And I'm using rainwater for my, my additions. And um, that's, uh, that's pretty straightforward stuff. I'm not- Rainwater, uh, huh? Thermal color, book chips, uh, none of that. So what comes out of the barrel is what happens. And um, this particular bottling, um, I actually unified 33 barrels of, of, of whiskey for this, 33 barrels of bourbon. Wow. Very cool. Together, so. Crispin, did you say that you are are uh, lo dropping proof with, with rainwater? Yeah. Did you hear that correctly? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is, is um, that a, I can't imagine that's a common thing. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's common in cognac. Oh, okay. Interesting. Good to yeah. know. Yeah. And so the rainwater gets filtered. And uh, then it's very pure. Uh, Mendocino County has really clean air and the rain is really wonderful and the water is really wonderful. So we're very fortunate. Someone popped up with a question saying, was I making a 10, 10 ingredient bourbon? And I wanted to be clear about that. I'm making a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing complex blending of whiskeys. And what I was talking about, there was not necessarily a bourbon, but there's bourbon in it. So I'm, I'm blending uh, whiskeys that I've made. I'm not, I'm not buying any bulk spirits. Every drop in the bottle is made in the distillery by me. And so what I have is enough inventory in barrels to um, start doing complex blending. And it's something that Hubert said to me about brandy and about whiskey is, you know, single grains and single grapes and these things are, are really wonderful. But um, the real, you know, part of the real art comes in as we um, construct and unify uh, blends of, of whiskeys uh, for, for their variety of flavors that mesh well together. So right now, one of the things that's available is um, low gap blended rye. Mm. It's um, the current blended rye in the bottle is 93% rye and 7% malted wheat. And it's a blend of uh, six to 10 year old whiskeys. And I waited years to be able to do this. Okay. So I've got three more blends in barrels and a variety of, of barrels. Because once I've had them in new oak for so long, then I want to transfer them into used barrels because uh, I will reach a, a flavor profile that I want to keep. Yet I also want the aging process to continue. That evaporation through the through the staves that concentrates the flavor in the barrel is really important. So complex blending apparently is where it's at. And in the future, you'll see from me a rye bourbon blend and more rye wheat blends and lots of malted grain. Cool. Well, we're excited. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny when you talk about blending, I, I feel like that's, I mean, I think, you know, blending has always been a very hot thing in distilling, but I think it's becoming a little like hotter right now. I think people are really kind of, I, I've been talking to a couple, so Spirit Works up in Sebastopol, they just launched their first ever bourbon um, and they've been distilling for, for almost 10 years now, I think. And when I was talking to their distiller, she was just like, you know, I love distilling. I've been doing it for a long time. I really, it's great, but this is my first chance that I've had to blend. And I've really had to like learn the art of blending. And she like, she was just so excited, like a kid in the candy store when she was like, it's just a whole different level of distilling. It's where we get to be artists and we, it's less about like control and science. And it's really about just like playing with flavors. And it seems like, and there, there was a couple other people I've talked to recently who've had a similar kind of story around blending and learning about blending for their first time. And it just seems like, you know, especially younger distillers who are just kind of getting into this are A, like that's a challenge learning how to blend properly. And so I think they leave it until a little later in their distilling career. But when they start playing around with it, it's like a whole new kind of part of their job that just really opens up some really exciting possibilities for the taste and complexity of spirits. That's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So, and, and I think it's an interesting point to make because I think you know, especially when you think about scotch, everyone kind of poo poos blended scotches and thinks that they're not as good as like single malts and everything. And I just think our perception on what blending means needs to change. Um, blended doesn't mean 
I have a bunch of things that are subpar and I'm blending them together to try to make it better. Now, of course, there are some instances where distillers certainly do that, but you know, if you find a great distiller who knows what they're doing, blending takes a lot of great ingredients and brings them to an even higher level together. It's the whole, you know, one plus one equals three kind of thing. So yeah. I think blending is amazing. It's, it's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. It really becomes something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Just like yeah. you were saying, one plus one does equal three. And, um, you know, it's amazing. You know, I can go through even a, even like, let's talk bourbon. I can go through barrels of bourbon and over the course of months, I will, I will taste barrels and take notes and, and, and note the progress of aging and individual barrels. I'll take individual notes on, but when you start unifying those barrels together, um, um, what may be ups and downs in terms of how the wood is reacted, individual barrels have reacted with the spirit, um, starts to kind of smooth out a bit, if you will. It, it won't be so many peaks and valleys if you experience those by, by combining those barrels together. And uh, it really does become something greater than, than, um, than, the, than the notes, the notes had on all the individual barrels. So it's, uh, it's really something to uh, consider. Single barrels are great. I just bottled a single barrel of uh, a cask strength rye that's really wonderful. Um, I got barrels from Canton Cooperage in Kentucky um, made of uh, uh, staves that were um, air dried for 36 months. Really fantastic wood. Some of the best barrels I've ever purchased and the most expensive barrels I've ever purchased. But absolutely, absolutely worth it. And yeah. you see how this, this bourbon is really light. And yeah, I actually wanted it that way. It has a lot of character. It's really focused on the grains. Um, but this, the, the barrel strength, low gap straight rye whiskey that I just released is only 210 bottles of it in the whole world. And um, um, it is absolutely a wonderful integration of the alcohol, which is 63%, which sounds daunting, but the flavor of the grain and the flavor of the wood and the alcohol is so well integrated and it's so smooth. I'm really shocked. It is three years old. And a part of what we're experiencing is the effect of the distillation process, where I'm able to, in the second distillations, I'm able to carefully select the heart of that distillation based on the information given to me in my apprenticeship, okay, and making brandy. I apply that, where do I make the cuts? And um, some people take a, a larger heart than I do and cut to tails or seconds later than I do, sometimes a whole hour later than sure. I cut. And so that may, you know, that may change things a little bit, but uh, I certainly, um, uh, certainly come out with a very palatable product on day one. Very, very easy to drink on day one. And so I also have a um, basically an unaged, I've released unaged spirits that I've only added water to. There's a low gap clear rye out there in the world. Cool. The 2017 bottling of that is really, really remarkable. So um, That's another one we have to change the perception on is unaged whiskey. There are some yeah. really you know, people have this perception that unaged whiskeys are the old school moonshine, moonshine that yeah. is like super, super burn you and like just not that good quality. And there are some really beautiful unaged whiskeys out there um, right now that are that are pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, people are doing a really good job in this industry. And it's the other thing I really appreciate about, about the other distillers in the world. We're all working hard. We all want to make a great product. And so many of them are. It's really terrific. It's really a special kind of a renaissance going on right now. And, you know, I know we're all glad to be a part of it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, Crispin, let's raise a glass to Crispin and thank him for giving us a nice history and hearing and cheers, everyone. Thank, thank you, you Crispin. for this delicious, delicious bourbon. Okay. Thank you both for having me. And I'm, I'm uh, Proud to be on the line here with Alexander, and uh, we're at opposite ends of the country, but yeah. absolutely cheers and uh, cheers. thumbs up to you, sir.
And thank you both for having us on. It's of course, of course. And I appreciate being That's our pleasure. Story and uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I have to give a little plug because you mentioned earlier that um, the Karasevic family and Jermaine Raban were kind of the first to bring in, um, you know, alumic pot stilling and that they've been distilling for a very long time and have all this deep expertise. And so the Karasevic family is Charbet and we do have an event coming up with them the day before Father's Day. So it's a great time to get your dad and have an experience with him virtually since we can't do other things. Um, and so Charbet will with, uh, be with us and they use a beautiful cognac still as well, very similar to what you saw in some of the pictures here. Um, and speaking of blended whiskeys, one of their whiskeys is blended. It's three different blends of um, whiskeys distilled from craft beer, actually. And it's one of my all-time favorite whiskeys. It's called Doubled and Twisted. So we'll be tasting that and a couple of their other whiskeys. And we'll be tasting some of their vodkas as well. So um, that's, that's going to be a really fun event with another really great history. They're our 13th generation distilling family. Um, so, you know, if you like the history lesson and if you like kind of hearing the origin stories and things of that nature, that will be a fun one on June 20th. Uh, Crispin, you mentioned one of the products that you make uh, that kind of caught my ear and I actually remembered reading about it uh, when I was studying up on you. And can you tell us just a little bit, I know this, this is a bourbon event, but can you tell us just a little bit about the rose liqueur? That sounds absolutely fascinating. The rose liqueur, well, um, you know, um, I got started on the rose liqueur for a couple of reasons. And one of them was that um, I actually, I, I kind of busted my back 20 years ago and I was out of work and I didn't, couldn't imagine what else I'm going to do with my life, but make spirits still. So I started talking to Ansley Cole in 2001 and uh, my wife and I came up Mar, my wife and dear partner, came up with the idea for making rose liqueur uh, in the year 2000. And uh, what kind of sealed us, we had a friend from Belgium who was making a rose liqueur that was, it was light and it was, it was okay. You know, which really made great chocolates go with it. But um, the, um, the original Renaissance Fair in California was happening, used to happen in a place called Black Point. And on the very last day of the Renaissance Fair at Black Point, these many years ago now, in, in 2000, um, um, somebody showed up with some homemade rose liqueur, making a longer story short. And we, I saw how people reacted to that. I didn't get to taste that, but I saw how people reacted to that. And that kind of sealed it for us. We really got to do this. And at home, my wife and I used to manage a um, a 55 acre retreat center in the, in the mountains up here. And there was a hundred different roses in the garden. So I started out with an idea of what the rose liqueur would be. And it actually took us three years to develop the rose liqueur that we can consistently make year to year. I thought there would be one rose and one alcohol base. The alcohol base for our rose liqueur now is an old family recipe of uh, spirits made from apples and honey. And I got that recipe from um, my uncle Frank, who worked in my, his father, my grandfather's distillery for many years. And um, when he was 90, he passed that on to me. And it was hard to get anybody in the family to talk to me about what really happened in the distillery, but Frank did. So we went to work in the second year of development and uh, over the course of the next 24 months we found the 17 different roses that go into the rose liqueur. I worked on a specific concentration of roses. I had to figure out exactly how many grams of roses into how many milliliters of alcohol at what alcoholic strength to come out to what we want. And so wow. our rose liqueur is about 25% alcohol, about 9% sugar, wow. and uh, very rich in rose. And uh, so rose petals are macerated or steeped in the apple honey spirit. I mean, it's, it's going on right now at the distillery. There's rose liqueur being made. We have 160 rose, individual rose bushes that produce the petals. We cut roses on a given day, 
take the roses to the distillery, pluck the petals, and only petals go into this. No green parts, no bees knees, no stamen, and it all happens. So I even have a cute little 30 liter basket press for pressing out the roses when we're done oh. with the maceration. Of course, the high press makes the best stuff. So, so that's kind of it. It was a labor of love. We wanted to bring beauty into the world. I started with, um, I found a 300 year old Italian recipe that the book said, oh, this is, went out of fashion long ago. And I, you know, and I just worked on it until it, until it came up just roses. So. That's incredible. Very I bet, fitting. Yeah, that's that's. I bet that's a intense but beautiful smelling distillation oh my process. Gosh. Oh, that must be <laughs> <Yeah>. wild. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And very fitting that there's uh, flowers in the in your background there. Yeah, yeah, I cool. love it. Oh yeah, yeah. Roses okay. from the very roses that we make the roses grow from. That's cool. <laughs> hey, hey, Ed, I'm gonna call on you here. You said you're drinking low gap and you're drinking a couple of other bourbons too, and comparing and contrasting. I'd love to hear. What else you're drinking and kind of what what you're thinking with with low gap yeah don't judge me because it's you know not quite four o'clock yet in honolulu and uh i've already got four bourbons open and drinking them while i'm sitting here online we're your excuse to drink we love that right so yeah just trying to do my part but uh no actually yeah, I'm, I'm drinking a low gap bourbon uh you know I, I bought the bottle uh because of the event and um yeah i'm really enjoying it when i first opened it uh about a week ago you know, I agree with you, Suzanne. It's really easy drinking, and um, you know, you know, enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it tasted uh, like a younger whiskey, but um, you know, still had I could tell. I mean, a really good distill it, and so I, I liked it. So I opened it. I I kind of reached around and took some uh, you know other small producers that I have, and yeah. so this one's from a, actually a brewery in Indiana called 18th Street Distilling. Okay. Um, they uh, they make really great beer, and their whiskey's really good too. Um, so I. Uh, you know, pulled that, and then um, this one is actually from Michigan. I used to live in the Midwest. Oh, I know Journeyman. They're cool. Yeah, They're Journey, cool Journeyman's store. great, and, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy those guys, and then I've got another one, uh, the Jefferson's Ocean from, uh, you know, which is, you know, a, a bigger brand, but, um, uh, yeah, I was really surprised. I mean, when I was sitting here, you know, I, I tend to like, uh, you know, a lot of oak uh, on the spirits, and, but, you know, kept going to the low, uh, the low gap and, you know, I get a lot of cocoa on the nose, but uh, yeah, that was, that was something in my comment, just it kind of impressed me that, uh, you know, compared to the others that have a lot more oak or a lot more, you know, uh, you know, age on them, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, just as complex in its own right, but, uh, you know, in a very different way and being really easy drink, you know, easy drinking. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. And it's funny, I didn't get cocoa on the nose before, but now that you say that and I smell that, I was getting um, toasted marshmallow for some reason. I get butterscotch. Yeah. And um, but now that you say cocoa, I definitely picked that up. And so between the toasted marshmallow and the cocoa, I have a s'mores going on in my glass here. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of kind of tasting notes, Melissa had asked a question about kind of particular yeah. tasting notes. And I don't know if you with your psalm palette a little bit want to just tell us what you're smelling and tasting and other people can chime in too. Well, uh, you know, in addition to the butterscotch notes, um, yeah, you know, I, I feel like there's kind of a, a little bit of, I don't know, I guess kind of like a white pepper. Uh, it's not really an aroma, more in the back palate, just mm -hmm. a little bit of warmth that isn't strictly from the alcohol. Um, and maybe that shines through because it isn't dominated by, you know, lots of heavy oak influence. Yeah, sure. Um, I also get, funnily enough, um, for those of you who've had agricole rums that are made from the fresh sugar cane, there's that like grassy, yeah. slightly funky likeness going on. And I get a little bit of that mm -hmm. like grassy funkiness going on in this, which I love. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, any any tasting notes that, uh, that you recognize and, and appreciate about your low gap, Kristen? Um, I appreciate Ed mentioning the, the cocoa and in fact, well-made spirits, even when they're new, have, have that chocolatey cocoa character to it. And, um, and then ha having that carry over through aging, but not be a dominant thing, but a recognizable thing, uh, tells me that, uh, Ed has some experience with good spirits and he knows what he's talking about, which is pretty darn cool. So um, I, I really dig that a lot, um, hearing that feedback from people, because I know it's there, but 
one of my jobs is to listen to what people like. Yeah. You know, I can sit in the distillery and like something all day long, but if the rest of the world doesn't agree with me, I'm drinking a lot of booze, right? <laughs> so, um, so listening to what people like and aiming for that as we go is uh, part of my job. And so um, getting feedback from people is really um, helpful to me and sure. it isn't just, um, you know, an ego thing at all. It's, a, it's about the goal and, and, and the journey, you know, so. Right. Yeah, love it. Makes it. a huge difference hearing about it. So I appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. I get. I also get kind of a little bit of. I can't put my finger on it, but it's some kind of stone fruit. Mm. Um, mm. I don't know. Maybe maybe a, like a black black cherry. Ah oh, man. This is my, this is. My I've been favorite. like poking around trying to find it. And <laughs> this is my favorite game with Evan. He's if you guys have ever watched those Psalm movies, it's like I smell a garden hose in the like you know it's like he can find those things and I'm like what are you talking about like it's so fun but you know I, I find that one of like the telltale signs for me of something that I really want to get to know is when it's really challenging to pinpoint things that are definite when yeah. when they all kind of integrate and and your you know your your perception flows from one uh you know I guess influence or inclination to another and you can't really put your finger on it uh, that's when I want to drink more of it. <laughs> For sure. And speaking of drinking more, yeah, let's move on to. Thank our you next so much for your time, thank you, Kristen. Kristen. Yeah, and thank you for your questions and comments, everyone. We yeah. love that. Um, yeah. And uh, we're gonna move over now to our next bourbon. We're gonna move across the country, DC. Made, going back, going back to the East Coast here now. Um, welcome back, Alex. Alex joined us a few Great to be back. for the, our gin tasting with the, the Simple Goodness Sisters. So we're excited to have him back to talk about his bourbon. Which, if you like gin, check out their gin because I'm actually, I, I again, I don't sip gin straight. I don't think many people do. Um, but his gin, I can actually sip straight. It has a really nice, like, viscous mouthfeel. Um, it's very smooth. It's not super juniper heavy, which I tend to shy away from are the super juniper heavy gins. Um, so if you like gin, check out the district made gin as well, because yeah. we had a lot of fun with them at that gin event too. Yeah. Oh, but now you. we're talking bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk bourbon. So, um, you know, bourbon is our number one seller because we're here in the United States and, uh, Americans love bourbon. Um, and for good reason. It's a, it's a lovely, uh, lovely whiskey. So, um, yeah, we're really excited uh, about our bourbon. Um, you know, we were we were talking about how uh, so much of bourbon is made in Kentucky, and there's a, different styles, of course. But overall, there there are some uh, characteristics about a Kentucky bourbon. Uh, we're not so far from Kentucky here, but. Um, but we really did want to do something a bit different here. Uh, like, like Crispin was talking about, a very unique mash bill um, that I definitely, uh, I, I wish I had taken advantage of purchasing a bottle ahead of time, but I, I may have to try it now. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish I had had the chance to meet you uh, back when I lived in the, in the Bay Area and, and was developing my, my tastes and my palate, uh, mostly in, in visits up to wine country, but my, my previous career was biotech. I did that for almost 20 years, uh, mostly again in the San Francisco area. And then um, found myself in DC, uh, also working in biotech. And then um, a buddy of mine, who I know since undergrad, uh, decided he wanted to open a distillery and, and he thought that my knowing a little something science would, uh, would be useful. So we went for it and I uh, trained up at a uh, great distillery, and now they concentrate on bourbon. It's most of what they do. At the time, they were doing gin and vodka as well. Uh, Smooth Ambler is the distillery out in West Virginia. Cool. Um, yeah, and we had a, a great time with them, learned from them, uh, and, uh, you know, our distilling has changed as theirs has, uh, going from, as Crispin was talking about, going from the, uh, or I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, the, uh, the pot still to a, co a column still, um, which is again what you find more of these days because it's wow. it's just far more efficient and you can process a lot more that way. Um, so for me, when we talk about most of our spirits, I'm gonna focus on the bourbon, of course, tonight. Uh, really, 
it's about the terroir. I can take credit for how I design my mash bill, how I, uh, you know, do that mash, the yeast strains I choose, the fermentation conditions, how I distill on the stills, the cuts that we make, but, uh, but really it's the farmer and it's the grain and it's the, the varietals of grains uh, that, that I think define our spirit. Um, there was a great study done in Ireland a few years back and they, uh, they took barley grown in different regions in Ireland. They brought it back to the same distillery and you know, it was already malted and they distilled it. And then they analyzed the results. They could detect different chemicals based on where it was, was grown. So the idea of terroir, we know about it in wine, of course, it's well established, but it's more and more being understood in spirits. And it really does impact the flavor of the spirit. Yeah, it's interesting, um, Alex. I'd love to just pause on that for a second because that's a really cool. interesting comment. And I don't think a lot of people think about terroir when they think about spirits currently. Um, and I think actually vodka is one of the best examples where you can start to see this come to life today because vodka, you know, historically has been very clean, very like no taste kind of, that's what it's been known for. And I feel like the craft movement has really started to move it where I've recently discovered myself that wheat vodkas and especially wheat vodkas from Illinois versus wheat vodkas, like they, you can taste the difference. And if it's like, that's all that's going on. And it's like, there's no aging, there's no anything else confusing your palate. Sense. It really, that's what, like, if you want to test this theory a little bit, start playing around with some craft vodkas just to see a wheat vodka versus a corn vodka versus a grape vodka. And then a red heirloom wheat vodka. And like, it really, so I, I love that idea and to encourage people to start thinking about our spirits the same way we think about wine, the same way we think about food. And it's not just a commodity. It's not just you know, you can throw whatever green you want in there and it will come out tasting fine. It really, good ingredients in make a delicious, you know, bottle of booze. And that, and that yes. tends to be more expensive. That tends to be harder, a bigger labor of love and all those things, which is why, in our opinion, craft is worth the often sometimes more premium price because it really like it's, you know, junk in, junk out. And this is not anywhere near that. This is like really being thoughtful about where you're sourcing from and what you're doing with it and those labors of love. So I, I love that. Yeah, no, your point of vodka, I mean, for me, I was definitely interested in tasting vodka because we make a very flavorful vodka our, ourselves, but mm -hmm. I was at a, um, uh, it was uh, the Bar Convent Brooklyn a couple of years ago, and Belvedere was there with their single estate rye vodka. So rye grown in different regions, uh, distilled to, in Europe, it has to be 192 proof, so over 96% ethanol, very little anything else and you could taste the difference just where the that rye was grown so, uh, so for us for the bourbon we actually have a four grain bourbon so there's rye wheat of course the corn and then the malts and for us malted barley as well as malted rye uh, we work with farms in virginia and in maryland uh, and then we work with a very small malt house down in North Carolina, down in Asheville, uh, Riverbend Malt House for both malts. Um, the, uh, you know, the corn in what we come to think of the corn in a most bourbon is this yellow dent corn. It's not terribly exciting. Uh, and it's definitely has that cloyingly sweet. Oh, that's one of the farms. That's Land's End in Mar uh, Maryland, Chestertown right on the tip of the peninsula. That's where the corn is grown. It's a varietal called Hickory King. It's a white kerneled corn, really lovely stuff. Um, and it was, uh, that's uh, Pepsi. He just goes by Pepsi. I don't know his real name, Pepsi, the farmer there. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great varietal. It's still pretty, pretty small then. It grew up to over 12, 13 foot wow. a year. Uh, yeah, it's a gorgeous spot. Uh, but this corn was just, you know, the first time we tried to distill it, we really came to love it just coming off of uh, uh, coming off the still. Uh, it didn't have just the sweetness of corn that we're used to in other corns. Had a nice creaminess almost, a um, uh, butterscotch, uh, butterscotch uh, quality that we just really loved. It's my partner Sandy Wood there. Uh, and some of our barrels, those are uh, some of the smaller casks, I believe, back there. 
we don't use any of the smaller casks in the bourbon. We still have some that we use in our rye whiskey. Mash ton and fermenters we're seeing there. Uh, super sacks of grain. The, this is a lot more crowded now. There's a lot more barrels <laughs> back there. Uh, all the bourbon is coming out of 53 gallon independent stave. Here's our stills, yeah. So um, two stills we were looking at. The front is our hybrid pot still. Uh, we re do redistill the bourbon uh, on the pot. We do not use the columns. We bypass them all together. You can't see it above where the, the picture would be. You can just connect right across to the condenser. Mm. Uh, behind that is the continuous column still. So we're stripping on the continuous column and redistilling on the pot. Uh, these are new stills. The bourbon that we're drinking today, if you have the bottle, uh, came off of our old still which was another hybrid pot still, so not a column. Um, so yeah, back to the mash bill really quick. So we actually do distill two varieties. We have the high rye and we have the weeded. Uh, the high rye, they both are 59% corn. Again, it's that white hickory king. 24% uh, is our secondary grain. So either the wheat or the rye and then 18% malt in either case. In the case of the high rye, we stick with malted rye. Uh, in the case of the wheat, we stick with malted barley, which is a little bit more traditional a mash bill there. Uh, a little bit lower on the corn and higher in uh, the secondary grain. Uh, we do love those extra characters. Then after aging for a minimum two years, uh, and now the last batch was all over three years, um, we do blend both varieties back together with a slight preference on the uh, on the high rye. So there's going to be more of the rye character in the in the bourbon. I was wondering because this definitely it's a bit more kick. Smells and drinks yeah. like a high rye, and it, it's you know this is a a fascinating example right here of the spectrum of bourbon because I, I love that we have these two bourbons side by side yeah. because they are very different. They drink very differently. They have different characteristics. I mean, even the color, you can kind of see if I hold them up next to here, um, you know, one is quite a bit darker, one's a little bit lighter from the different aging. Um, and so it is a really fun kind of challenge to you that like, oh, not all bourbon is just bourbon. Like they, there really is a spectrum. And I, I love the spicy notes on this. This is really fun. I agree. Yeah, I think on the, the nose, we're definitely getting the oak. Uh, we also, I think, start to get some of the um, characters from the wheats, I think, come out on the nose, um, like almost a cinnamon roll. Uh, and then, you know, the first sip, you're getting that, that creaminess from the corn, the sweetness, but not quite as sugary sweet. I mean, it's definitely more uh, butterscotch and creamy. Um, and then I think you get more, a little bit more of the wheat coming through later in the back of the palate and then the, you know, the spice gets you and it's nice. I find it to be, you know, on the drier side for a bourbon, particularly is, a young bourbon. Yeah. yeah. And just, you know, a super nice sipper or in any number of cocktails, it really is uh, cocktail friendly. Yeah, I could see this making a really nice Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, despite uh, the, the fact that these are both bourbons and we just were discussing the clear differences between them. I think something that's really fun too is the fact that neither of these have that cloying sweetness. You know, there's yeah. certainly aromas uh, on the low gap of, I thought it was butterscotch, Suzanne thought Toasted it was marshmallow, marshmallow. chocolate. But yeah. it didn't have that, um, the, the mouthfeel that belays some of these, some of these bourbons out there. And then this one, you know, uh, has that spice of course that carries it. Yeah. Um, through any kind of tendency towards sweetness, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a little richer too. It's like, if I had to give them seasons, this would be like my fall winter bourbon and low gap might be my like summer spring bourbon, you know, like they- Spring they, bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> um, We're drinking it right now. Yeah, that's right. Springtime. I mean, they're both great for all year, don't get me wrong, sure. but like it is fun to kind of compare and contrast them like that, yeah. Yeah, there's so much variety out there and, and we, we're just having a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness, I'm, I'm losing my battery on my, phone, my, cam, my uh, computer here. Uh -oh. uh oh. I may have to jump on the phone. All right. If I, if I, if I'm, if you lose me here. But we'll do anyway. it again. 
I have a backup. All right. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the it's just, it's just a, you know, it's such a fun spirit and we can't wait to start releasing some single casks. Uh, but as we were talking about earlier, it's, there is uh, so much fun to the blending. And uh, we gave ourselves a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit opportunity for more experience by um, sourcing some more mature bourbons. We brought in both a high rye and a weeded bourbon from different distilleries. Those barrels are now, you know, we've been distilling at 1.8 for a little over five years. We have uh, barrels that are 14 years old. Obviously, we didn't make, make them. And we've been using those in a different series. We call that the Untitled series. Uh, but it gave us that experience to blend mature bourbons before ours was even, you know, months old. And uh, that was really, really a great experience. So that when we were ready to release our first batches, we knew a lot about the different experience in bourbon. Because, you know, as I was saying about as much about the terroir as there is about these other aspects of distillation, ultimately, the whiskey is spending so much time in oak. And the barrel itself is going to give so much of the character to the spirit. You work with a great cooperage, that's one thing, but you can get in a whole bunch of barrels from the same cooperage, from the same season, and you can have a, a wildly different effect on a, on a whiskey. You know, Rude speaking of barrels, we had a question come in from um, Ed earlier. When did the laws change that you could use other than American oak? Was that, you said that was pretty recently? Yeah, I think within the last three or four years. It's, oh, it's wow. been, since we've been distilling, it's not uh, that old. Interesting. I, I don't know why you would, but yeah. But the minimum of 51% corn, that's still the law, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Yeah, 51% corn coming off the still at less than 160, going into the barrel less than 125. Okay. And it has to be aged for a minimum of two years, right? If you're calling it straight. Uh, if you're calling it straight. If you don't call it straight, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we recently opened one of those uh, or a couple actually of, of those old 14 year old barrels, not our own make. Um, they were generally in the 120 to 125 proof range. We had one at 114, very different flavor profile. We had one at 142. Wow. So these are the same barrels from the same cooperage, whiskey made by the same distillery at the same time. It's just, uh, and they were all stored in the same, same Rick house. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow. Yeah, it is really, that was another thing that we had read about, um, you know, Kentucky and why that kind of where the bourbon came from is because their temperature swings are really good for, you know, those colder winters and the warmer summers right. and really getting the wood to extract and kind of do that a little bit more quickly than in more mild temperature regions. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, the barrel makes such a big difference. So it is, it is that. I was just thinking as we, we were talking about barrels earlier with Crispin too, and I was thinking, I was like, man, Maybe we should do a virtual event when we're allowed to go places again, where Evan and I go to a cooperage and we like bring you all around with us and you can see them firing the barrels and like, cause I've done that and I visited a cooperage and it is fascinating to see how they make those barrels and how they fire them from the inside and char them. And you know, it's, it's, it's a really- Yeah, you know, the, the discussion of terroir can be extended into the barrels yeah. and the fact that- Where that oak comes from. And I mean, I know as, as far as wineries are concerned, there are some wineries that don't just purchase French oak barrels. They go to France and they decide that they want French oak from the Limousine forest or the Nevers forest yeah. or the Tronceau forest because they each have their own distinct characteristics the same way corn grown one place or rye grown another or grapes grown yet another will have variations from place to place. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Sense of place is a really neat thing to experience a, a I guess a way to travel right now while we are unable to do so physically. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Can, can I chime in about French barrels for just a moment? Yeah, please. please. So um, whereas my bourbon is strictly in, in American oak, um, my ryes spend their two years in American oak and then I'm, I'm, for extended aging, I'm transferring them into other barrels, like um, used or reconditioned uh, Limousano cognac barrels. 
Um, I'm also using uh, Grand Premier Cru Sauterne barrels, used Cabernet Sauvignon barrels, and um, I'm really happy with the results I'm getting out of that. So I'm just going to add that to the mix. Um, yeah. um, my older rye blends, you're going to see more of those characters in it, and um, and it's just part of what I'm doing. So I really yeah, thank you, Crispin. Yeah, really, it's a fascinating component of of uh, making any spirit that it, that is aged. I have to say, one of my favorite winery experiences at a winery that shall remain unmentioned because Evan makes fun of it. <laughs> um, but they do this um, side by side tasting in their barrel room, where it's the exact same wine from the exact same grapes, the exact same vineyard, put in different barrels and not only different like French French oak versus American oak but then they'll do medium char versus light char versus heavy char and you get to taste them straight from the barrel side by side and it's fascinating it's just so fun to like I, I mean I'm a market researcher by trade so these types of things where it's like you're isolating a single variable and kind of tasting the differences it's such a fun experiment to really play with that um, and that's, yeah, and you can really, I, I mean, I always knew that barrels had an important role in this, but until you taste it yourself and know that that's the only thing changing to really see how much it impacts the wine, um, it's amazing. And then with spirits, it's even more so, I think, because the high alcohol content is really kind of sucking in that, that flavor profile. Very so much it's, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I, I want to say one more thing about terroir and barrels. So I say, oh, I'm using American oak barrels, and that's really a general statement. But I'm using American oak from Kentucky, Missouri, and Minnesota with specific intent and results. And so the terroir difference between those three places is really incredible. And uh, the flavors I get from uh, uh, the barrels from, let's say, the Black Swan Cooperage in Minnesota is really um, is really wonderful flavor, and uh, and very intense. It's very tight grain, um, and then the barrels from Kentucky. I really think the barrels in Kentucky from Kentucky are uh, a huge factor in great bourbon, and I highly recommend it. Uh, if there's any distillery out there not using barrels from Kentucky, they better get some and get some good ones because. Uh, it's just part of the whole mix and uh, it looks towards the home of bourbon and it's, you know, I'm in California, but I'm still looking eastward and it makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's really yeah. fun. Yeah, Very yeah we work with Independent Stave Company and they're using, they're sourcing oak in Missouri and Kentucky. And uh, yeah, it's, they're lovely barrels. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Everyone, can we raise a glass and cheers for all the great district made and one eight education that we got here? Cheers. Cheers, Alex. Thank you so much. It's so fun to, to be with you again and hear about your bourbon um, now that we know all about your gin. So it's yeah. fun to keep learning about your different your different spirits. And I know we have one of your ryes here too. So hopefully we'll get you back again to do a rye in the future. Yeah, that'd be fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll yeah. have to do a, maybe we'll have to do a bourbon versus rye side by side kind of right with both we, of them. We, That'd be fun. Head we to can head. actually combine the two. Uh, you know, Crispin was talking about blending spirits on our next release uh, coming out. Untitled number eighteen coming out next month is is a blend of our rye with a fourteen year old bourbon that we sourced. Very uh, cool. It's it's you know a lovely lovely blend. Why not? We don't just have to have separate categories. Why not blend different spirits together and have them join the party? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I believe in the link that I threw into the chat box there, the the shop page on your website uh, heralds the new release of the Untitled 18. So yeah. if anybody's interested, yeah, we, they can go check it out there. Yeah. Do we have another question? Do you want to throw that? Um, oh, yeah. Minnesota versus Missouri? Oh, sure. Um, Crispin? Alex, do either of you want to speak to the qualities of the barrels or the wood rather that you find coming from Minnesota versus Missouri? And why Minnesota and Missouri? I mean, they grow trees everywhere, right? Like yeah. why, why are those two regions known for their barrels so much? Um, um, so the further north we go, um, the harsher the winter. 
and Minnesota's got really tough winters. And so the way that way the wood grows, um, the individual rings are smaller and closer together. So the brown stuff that comes out of the oak that we all appreciate in in brown spirits um, is more concentrated in wood that's grown further north. And and then the barrel is I mean it's really hard wood, really tough wood, and um, and so then the wood further south has a wider grain and actually imparts a bit less of all that. And then the soil it grows in, the terroir, we're talking about flavor. So the soil it grows in is, um, is different. And so there's different flavors, different oak flavors that come out of these different places, the wood from these different places. And so when I'm talking about Minnesota, I'm actually uh, like for the rye, for the blends, uh, for the malted wheat I make, I put some of that whiskey into new small cooperage, 15 gallon and seven gallon, and let that stuff sit five to seven years. And by the time it comes out, it is it by itself is so oaky out of that barrel, you can't drink it. But as a blending component, it is a wonderful flavor. And we want this character in it. It's just really great. So eventually, you gotta you, you gotta have me on with my rye blend, okay? We should all come back to <laughs> those two blends and uh, and have a really good time with that. And uh, you'll see the other end of the spectrum of flavors I'm creating on the other end of this bourbon thing, okay? Because you're right, this is light. It's really approachable. It's fun, and um, but the ryes I'm making are a whole different ball game. So. Sounds like we might need to have both of you back. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, one of our guests who's been to a couple of our events um, and actually introduced us to our winemaker for next week's event was messaging me earlier at the beginning of this saying they know a great rye producer that we should feature. So maybe we'll have them too and we can just do a rye session. That would be really fun. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great. Yeah. Um, Alex, I noticed that uh, you made yourself a cocktail and... Yeah. I'm just curious what your what your what you're sipping on. What your cocktail choice is for someone that's you know responsible for the pure product and how you like to drink it when it's not in its element. You know, it's it's funny. I, I did not cocktail much before embarking in this career. Uh, and I'm learning a lot, mostly from the people that I'm uh, sharing my products with. Um, I also love some online resources. Difford's Guide is a great one to go to. Um, but really, we have great, great people that know so much at the distillery. Um, and the last time we were on for the gin, of course, I was sipping the gin neat all evening, and you guys were enjoying cocktails. So tonight I make cocktails, and you guys are sipping the bourbon <laughs> neat all night. But, um, but so the, Earlier this evening, I began with a paper plane, which is a variation on the last word. Um, it's a it's super easy cocktail, equal parts bourbon. Uh, Campari is the original, but it was switched at one point to Aperol. Uh, lightens it up a bit. Uh, there's an Amaro. Uh, I used a, a local DC one, Amaro de la Serene. If you make that out. And then um, lemon. So four equal parts, three quarters of uh, an ounce each. It was a nice lighter cocktail to start the evening. And now I'm drinking, uh, there's, um, there's a term that I've come to know in, a little bit in the industry, uh, a cocktail that might be a handshake, uh, which you don't necessarily know it. You don't know it. It's on, not necessarily on the menu. Uh, we had someone that ran our taste room some, a couple of years ago, and uh, she came up with this handshake, which is equal parts uh, of our bourbon and uh, an Amaro, uh, Angostura Amaro. Mm -hmm. Really lovely Amaro. 50-50. Huh. Super easy. Uh, easy to drink. I have this one on a rock, but otherwise, you know. Yeah, most of the time I'm drinking the bourbon neat or an old fashioned or an old, a Manhattan. For sure. Um, but really, the the old fashioned, the Manhattan, these are cocktails that predate bourbon. They were yeah. you know, classic cocktails that had really rye. When they called for whiskey, they called for rye. And we make rye, so I often make them with rye. Uh, the, the old fashioned I did, you guys mentioned, or we were talking before 
everything began about the IGTV. I did bourbon and rye uh, in that. Right. And that was actually really lovely as well to, to blend both. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, bourbon is one of those spirits that most of the time I am going to be sipping on neat, um, but why not cocktail with it sometimes? And, Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, we definitely do both as well. And we make lots of cocktails here. And I love that idea of like the handshake for each individual bar or distillery that it's like a different drink for their handshake. We, you know, in the, in the industry, you guys know the bartender's handshake is for net, at least here in San Francisco. So yeah. anytime you go to a bar and you order a a shot of Fernet, the bartender's like, oh, all right, you're in the industry. I got you. I got you. you know? <laughs> um, especially in San Francisco, we we drink a lot of Fernet here. So I think kind of we have the highest per capita outside consumption. Outside of Italy, I think. I believe so. Or in Argentina, maybe. Yeah. But definitely but, in the United States, San Francisco yeah, sure. drinks a ton of it. Yeah. But that's really fun. I love that. Um, well, we're coming up on time here. So I want to be conscious of time for everyone. Like I said, we're always happy to kind of keep chit chatting and hanging out for a little bit. But huge thank you to all of you for joining, to our makers especially for sharing their wisdom, their bourbons with us, their knowledge. Much obliged. But also to our guests. Like, thank you so much for showing up, for being enthusiastic, for asking questions, for buying these delicious bottles if you bought them already, for considering buying them in the future if you haven't yet, um, especially since there are some discounts. And if yeah. you're in the DC area, there's a discount if you go do pickup there. So Maybe make sure you, you get your hands on that. some of that uh, Untitled 18 too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Does anybody else have a, have a question or anything that they'd like to say about uh, your time here this evening or to Alex or Crispin? Don't, don't you all now talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do our wrap up, but we'll let people, if you do have questions, stick around. Um, so first, if you had a good time tonight and want to show your support, there's a few ways to do so. You can, of course, buy these beautiful bottles and enjoy them yourself. It's a very nice gift to yourself, but also a gift to the makers. Um, second, give them shout outs on social media, especially if you took any screenshots tonight or any pictures or anything. Make sure to tag them on social media, tag us as well. We'll reshare it with our audience. Um, if you had a great time tonight and want to keep coming to more of these, we appreciate the virtual Venmo tips, of course. Um, we also love social media shout outs, so make sure to be friendly with us on social. Whenever you're at home drinking something, feel free to tag us in it and we'll share our favorites. We always love to do that. Um, and we hope to see you at lots of future virtual events. Yeah, tell your friends, tell yeah, your family. We have a lot of great ones coming up. We were talking a little bit tonight about kind of deconstructing. I was talking about the whole like isolating one variable and like trying different things. And next week's I think is going to be a really fun example of that because we do have these two Rhone pr varietal producers. But if you're into wine, you've heard or have seen these GFMs um, are a popular kind of blended wine nowadays. We basically have one producer who has a GSM. So it's the blend of those three grapes. The three grapes are? Grenache, Syrah, and Mourvedre. Yes, so that's what GSM stands for. Um, and so we have one producer that has a blend of those. And then we have another producer that has those varietals individually. So it's going to be kind of fun where we get to kind of deconstruct the GSM yeah. and taste them individually, taste it blended. Um, so that's going to be kind of a fun deconstruction. And I'm particularly proud of the name of the event. Because he's very punny. It's okay to drink a roan. Get it? Get it? It's okay to drink a roan. It's okay to drink alone. You don't have to say get it. Of course they get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they don't. Um, yeah, so that's coming up next. We have vodka, we have cab, we have cider, we have all sorts of fun things coming up. We'd love to see you at more of these. We'd love for you to bring friends too, because it's fun for you to see your friends' faces, chat with them directly, you know, have a fun night. Yeah. Um, the Saturday before Father's Day for Charbet, I think it's going to be a really fun one. That'll be a little more of a happy hour since it's more just one maker. So bring your dad, have some fun with us. Um, and yeah, and all of our events are on our events page. If you signed up for tonight, which you did because you're here, you don't need to keep signing up for future events, just to let you know. You're on the we, list. You're, you're on registered. The list. You'll get the emails every week. It's the same Zoom link. It's the same meeting ID and password. So I know I've seen a few of you sign up kind of every week. And while that's nice for us, because we know you're coming and that makes us excited, um, you don't have to do that. So I just wanted to let you know that you will, you're, you're invited to all of them in perpetuity. Now that you signed up, we're expecting you to be here. <laughs> Be part of the community. <laughs> but let's do one last cheers, everyone. I'm going to do it with both of my oh, yeah. friends. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. We love you. The craft makers do as well. Cheers. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. All right. Now, if you want to hang out, feel free to unmute yourself. And now we'll.
get into the after partying. <laughs>